Uh, now I'd love to welcome Paul Begala, General Clark, <laughs> Karen Finney, and Mr. McCarty. Uh, Mr. Begala, I'm going to show you a photo, and I want you to oh tell god. us. Oh my god, a mugshot. Oh, yeah. What's in the photo? <laughs> this is a photo of uh, Bob Borston, myself, and George Stephanopoulos. And we're doing the see no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil uh, sign, which we uh, basically honored in the absence through that campaign. We did a lot of evil back then, but we survived. <laughs> You were the r rare person. You saw President Clinton both in the campaign, in the war room, and in the White House as counselor to the president. How was he different? Well, the campaign changed you first because you have to go across this amazingly diverse country. And that expanded him, and it caused him to grow. And then serving. And I think the bad times shaped him as much or more than the good because I think his deepest quality is empathy. And his critics never got that. And they mocked him when he said, I feel your pain. And I think, I think that's the, the soul of morality, actually, is to be able to feel other people's pain. And then the second most important is persistence. Well, I look back. When he was sworn in for his first term, his hand was on the Bible. He chose the passage from St. Paul's letter to the Galatians, 6th chapter, ninth verse. Do not grow weary in doing good, for in due course you shall reap if you faint not. Right? Just keep at it, keep at it, keep at it. And he lived that every day on the campaign and every day in the White House. The second term, then, his hand is on the book of the prophet Isaiah, the 58th chapter, 12th verse, which is, and thou shalt be called healer of the breach. Always trying to bring people together. And if, if I think back, that, that's the, the, the constant. But I think those two qualities of empathy and persistence kept growing the more he went through. And it was, I had the greatest seat in the house. I had the greatest job in the world. General Clark, you met President Clinton in 1965. Wow. He was at Georgetown. That's right. Uh, we were down there from West Point, a uh, classmate and I, for a conference. And um, so at the registration desk, one of the girls checking us in said their student body president at Georgetown was from Arkansas. And um, so we talked a couple of hours uh, on the two days of the conference, and uh, he was just totally impressive. At the end, he said, uh, well, what are you going to do? I was two years ahead of him. I was a senior. He was a sophomore. He was elected president of the student body as a second semester freshman at Georgetown. <laughs> That's how good he was, <laughs> really. And so, you know, when you talk to him, and, and by the time I'd been three years at West Point and traveled, you know, to Europe in the summer and done a lot of things, I'd seen a lot of people my age. I'd been to a lot of student conferences. He was the best I'd ever seen. And I said, he said, what are you going to do? I said, well, I'm going to try for a Rhodes Scholarship, but I'll go to Vietnam. He said, I think I'm going to try for a Rhodes Scholarship, too. And, um, and so I said, well, you know, you've shown interest in the country. You're talking about foreign policy and domestic policy and everything. I said, have you ever thought about politics? He said, yeah, a little. <laughs> <laughs> Karen Finney, you worked in the White House for the president in presidential scheduling and for the first lady. What did you learn about how this president, this first lady, ran their White House, ran their lives that has affected how you have taught other young people, how you have run your organizations, including the DNC, where you later were? I think um, a couple of things. I mean, most important, I was about 25 years old when we um, entered the White House. Uh, and to be a young woman who was raised pretty much by a single mother and surrounded by so many smart people, but so many smart women in particular, both on uh, Secretary Clinton's staff, but on the president's staff as well, was an incredible opportunity. And it, and it taught me um, confidence. And there was a woman named Evelyn Lieberman who was notorious for walking around. She would walk around, and if your skirt was too short or she thought your outfit was inappropriate, she would say, hiya, go home. She would send you home to change your coat. <laughs> but the other thing that she taught me that I always try to tell young women is, you know, you would go, and our chief of staff's thing was, if you have a problem, come with a, three ideas for a solution. So you would come and say, and you know, women tend to have their, let their voice go up at the end. And she would always say, are you asking me or telling me? Every single time. And you learn to train yourself not to do that. And it makes you just feel more confident and sound more confident. So I would say that is definitely uh, something I learned. On the Hillary side, uh, leaking is bad. Don't leak. <laughs> <laughs> did you find out the hard way? <laughs> I did not. Let me tell you, the very first day of the administration, our, we gathered our little, our, our little first lady team, and it was made very clear that uh, anyone who leaked would be um, 
punished accordingly. Uh, it was a little different on the president's side from time to time, I would say. Um, but I would say the other thing on the, just going, for, I mean, working for Hillary was amazing and working for the president, obviously also um, just an incredible opportunity. And again, just being surrounded by so many smart people and being encouraged as a young person uh, to give your thoughts and your ideas and your opinion. I mean, you know, I can remember sitting in like the White House Situation Room prepping for the president's trip to Africa. And, you know, I'm like 30 at this point, and I'm explaining to Sandy Berger and all these people like what I think should happen, and then you're telling the president, here's where I think you should go. Um, so really trusting younger people. Don't be afraid if you, you, you know, have ideas, if you disagree, know why you disagree, um, but being in an environment where you're able to do that. Mr. McCarty, you were the first FOB. You now split, <laughs> split your time uh, between Washington and Little Rock. But you still have a family home here in Little Rock and in Hope, in a place called Hope. That's right. And, and you're proud of it. So you're still the connection to Hope. What is Hope like now? Uh, Hope, when I was growing up, was a Norman Rockwell existence. It was a wonderful place to grow up, and you had values and examples to follow, beginning with your parents, but so many other leaders. I think, like uh, America, you know, America, the landscape has changed with technology and travel and, and all of that. So it's a, it's a different place, not necessarily better or worse, but it, it's different. The world's different, as Secretary Clinton said today. It's changing at a dramatic pace. Uh, Mr. Begala, you served both on a campaign and in the White House. How is it different for a trusted advisor <laughs> on the outside versus the inside? That's all the difference in the world. First off, the difference in campaign and governing. Governor Cuomo, the senior, Mario said it most famously, you campaign in poetry and you govern in prose. But also in a campaign, everything is what you say. It's everything. The message is everything in a campaign. In the government, stuff happens. I would use a different word, but my wife is here. <laughs> We've all been married 25 years. She has no idea, I swear. But, I got a but story for her. stuff happens every day. <laughs> well, to put, uh, you're saying it in a nice way. To put a little finer point on it, this is the president in my life. He said that you and others from the campaign were afraid I was sacrificing everything I believed in under the influence of people who weren't part of our campaign and didn't care about the ordinary Americans who elected me. There was an enormous tension between the ideal and the practical. And I think he resolved that wonderfully. But yes, and he encouraged that. That's the thing. It, he is truly for affirmative action in every kind. Did lots of different ideas. And then he would put us all in a room. And uh, our friend, Mr. Woodward, chronicled how messy it was. But all so of you're us, the one. Oh, sure. <laughs> I, and others. I, I talked about for that book. And I'm, I'm not like thrilled that I did, but it's there. Um, Wait, why, but, why does everybody talk to Bob? <laughs> I can't speak for everybody, but <laughs> Smart. first off, he is the preeminent journalist of our time, and you have to give him his due. And second, he just seemed to already have everything. It got so bad that Sperling would take these memos. When the President of the United States sees a memo, gets stamped, the President has seen. Gino was taking memos stamped, Bob Woodward has seen. <laughs> <laughs> just to hope that we wouldn't, right? So you kind of have to. But what, the, the thing about that book that, that uh, it chronicles all the mess, all the, but what it doesn't chronicle is the result that from that, from really tough clashes of really differing views, from like really idealistic campaign people who, like me, very naively thought, well, you just take all your campaign promises and you enact them in law. Well, then it turns out like there's a whole other party and there's two other branches of government and then there's the <laughs> business community and there's labor. And his ability to resolve all that, I loved it though. And I just learned so much by his insistence that we all fight it out and reconcile rather than simply saying, he always used to say this, beware of anybody who believes they're in sole possession of the truth. And I have that problem in spades. And I think it's one of the reasons he kept saying it to me. Um, <laughs> seriously, because a healthy skepticism is the most important thing you can have in government. Mike McCarty, you uh, were both counselor to the president, chief of staff to the president. You came to Washington as an outsider. Now you're very much an insider. What would you say about the sociology of Washington. How do you feel about how Washington is now? Well, how long do we have, Mike? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I wasn't exactly an outsider because I had traveled there for probably 20 years, both on the Democratic National Committee with Ambassador Strauss, who was chairman at that time, who responded easily to either ambassador or chairman, I might add. And then as Dean Rutherford knows, within the natural gas business, we had a lot of business in Washington, but primarily dealing with the Congress. Washington's changed a lot, Mike. 
it was in the process of changing, I think, when President Clinton was elected. I think the, the way we communicate has had a lot to do with that. You're right at the center of that with Politico. But it's changed. Um, and it, it, there's just so much more difficulty now in terms of finding any kind of common ground. As Al Fromm knows, the president ran as a new Democrat. So how do you build that consensus and bridge? At times, we didn't. Uh, at times, it was extremely acrimonious. But at times, particularly on foreign policy issues, we were able to forge, as General Clark knows, a pretty strong bipartisan consensus. And on certain issues, like welfare to work, we were able to forge that. But you've got to remember also, Mike, I think a key point to build on what Paul said. Governor Clinton was elected with 43% of the vote. Ross Perot got 19 percent. President Bush, uh, of course, got the remaining balance. But what that signified to me is over 60 percent of the country, almost two-thirds, had voted for change, not radical change, but significant change of direction. And that was the message of the campaign. Uh, and that's what we tried to build on in that first economic plan and deficit reduction. Paul's right. It was, pro the process was messy, but the outcome produced the first balanced budget in a long, long time and a real support of job creation. So I think my uh, stool is about to fall through the chair, so uh, I have to have a last question to General Clark. Uh, his new book, Don't Wait for the Next War, in the green room, he was just saying, welcome to Arkansas, the state where Democrats lost the Senate by 16 points. Well. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's a fact, okay? So, glad to have you. so <laughs> it's a fact. But, you know, I think, I think this is democracy. And I think you have to listen to what the voters say. You have to try to take the message aboard. And you have to uh, come up with the answer. That's what the two party system's all about. That's what the way elections work. And that's democracy. What makes it work in the United States is we take it seriously, we do it with integrity, and we believe our system is the best in the world. And real quick, we're all here to celebrate the 10th anniversary of the William J. Clinton Presidential Center. How has it changed Little Rock? Oh, this has completely opened up Little Rock in so many ways. People come here, they, they see the, its tourist attraction. In the first place, it brings people from all over the country. We have conferences. We have a, a Clinton a Graduate School of Public Service. So young people come here from all over the world. It, it's, it's been a wonderful gift to, to Arkansas and to Little Rock. And uh, we're so glad that President Clinton decided to put that library here and really let other people see the beauty of this state. And I think it's a great state, even if, if, even if Mark Pryor lost by 16 points. It's, it's still a great state, and it's going to be greater in the future. Your memories and your insights have been a great gift to us. Thank you all so very much. Oh, thank you. you. So kind of you to do that. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for doing that. So kind of you. You're so fantastic. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you gentlemen. Such a Thank you very much.